Okay, perfect. Thank you everyone for staying so far. Hopefully you are still somewhat fresh or at least excited for the talk that will be happening on this panel. So I'll try to work. <laughs> so we have four speakers with us today, three of whom are in person and we have one person who will be online. Um, so just to briefly introduce those, we have first Ocean van Galloway from Aquatics Belgium, who will be talking about decoding AI hype, unveiling the overrated problem for race against crime. And then we'll have John Christoph, who is a PhD researcher at the European University Institute, who will be talking about AI driven nuclear risk reduction strategies. And then we'll have in, in Ariane Manlock, who, uh, who is from the London School of Economic and Political Sciences, studying a China comparative perspective. And they will be talking about AI and global security dynamics navigating evolving military and geopolitical landscape. And lastly, we'll have Mahmoud Javadi, who is an AI governance researcher at the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. And they will be speaking about European democratic multilateralism and shaping global military AI governance. Um, so yes, just a reminder to all speakers that we aim for 10 minutes, um, possibly for your presentation, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So as everyone has been saying, choose to think of questions we can potentially ask the panelists, you know, write anything down, that kind of stuff, because you will have a chance to ask those questions. So first of all, I will go over to Osim, over to you. Shall we? Yeah. Greetings, everybody. First of all, I think it is necessary to introduce myself because you might want to know where I come from. So my name is Océane Van Gelouwe. I'm a French citizen. I'm currently working as a nuclear safety qualification specialist in Belgium. And I studied and graduated from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies and the MGMO University in Russia. Um, my thesis was on cybersecurity in nuclear power plants. So that's how I entered this field. On that note, if it's working because it doesn't, yes, it is. So, first of all, I would like to do a quick poll because I like participation. I have hand reason, that's my thing. So, who is afraid of AI? <laughs> Vast majority, wonderful. Who is not? Who doesn't know? Because it's okay also to not know. Thank you. Good. Well, on that thing, I think. Pop culture is very much influenced with us. I mean, we have been mentioning it, so I included some uh, things in my slides. So it can go from her with Joaquin Phoenix falling in love with AI sexy voice. I mean, it's Scarlett Johansson, if you don't mind. <laughs> then we have Blade Runner, the original. This is probably my favorite scene in all ways, all time cinema. <laughs> AI, uh, the movie that is the teddy bear AI. Oh, yeah, of course, I robot. <laughs> Obviously, Ex Machina, Blade Runner, Volume Two, uh, all the ones. Space Odyssey, old movie, very good. Recommended if you have not watched it yet. Oh yeah, Matrix, obviously. But in the end, um, you come a little like this. You have the Terminator, but in the end, you come up with Boss Bob Ross Nator. That's the thing. And yeah, finally, I mean. The most common use in reality of AI that we have is way less sexy than before. Uh, cats or dogs, dogs or cats, we figure it out, right? So, so that's the thing. Artificial intelligence, interesting term, right? What does artificial intelligence equalize to? If you look way back in history, not that back, but you know, in 1955 in the Dublin Proposal Conference, um, you had scientists that offered uh, to uh, analyze the theory of the automat of Alan Turing. And in this paragraph, they explained that they would like to make a study of artificial intelligence. That was the first time the term was used, as much as we are aware of, of course. And they wanted to carry out this study in the summer. And the studies proceed on the basis 
of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And that's the part that I like, simulated important aspects to remember. And in the end, the conference did not really go as planned, mostly because many different questions and ideological positions, well, um, emerged from the common discussion, creating what we call an AI winter. So people stopped looking at AI that much. And also another problem was related to the machinery at the time. We didn't have as much computational power that we have nowadays. Still, it had an enormous historical importance because we're still using the term nowadays, obviously. Now, why it does matter? It does matter because, like it or not, whether in democracy or not, public opinion still has some weight. And uh, fear of fantasies are wonderful humors. So we got, it's a study that was published in 2022, and they have made different polls, and they discovered that a significant amount of people, when they were watching movies about AI, basically, believed more that it was likely that they have in the future emotional partners that are AI, like, okay, or that you will have an apocalyptic robot going to attack you. They believe that more than it will have an impact on the economy or the surveillance tools that are already in use. Now, some polls that were inside the study, I understand what counts as artificial intelligence. Most people think they do, but you have some that are still relatively uh, circumspect, if we can say. You consider these to be AI and you have different types of technology. They are more or less having a lot of AI implementation. For example, big data is not AI per se. It's AI that uses big data. And you have still a considerable amount of people, 36% that considers that it is AI. So there is a misconception somewhere. So misinterpretation of the term. Uh, well, I mean, what do we, how do we get there with this divide between replicants narrative and the stupid robot narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Why this gap? And what we most commonly call AI today are machine learning, natural language processing, speech, expert systems, planning, scheduling, and optimization, robotics, and vision. If you consider it, NLP is mostly what OpenAI is doing. You'll have machine learning and then where we are a little afraid of the killer robots because more and more we see an implementation of neuronal decision making. The speech, the common one is Siri. And of course, I mean, everything that is applicable, you can use Google, Apple, they're always there. Now, what are the AI risks today based on machine learning and all the others? Well, I decided to divide this into a matrix because I think it's a good visualization. There are things that we know we know, there are things that we know we don't know, there are things that we don't know that we know, and there are things that we just don't know. That is pretty straightforward, right? Um, and with this configuration, we have the non knowns, and I try to summarize the most common ones. So the big brother on the way, and I think it's very well uh, related to the previous uh, presentation from DK Lu. Um, so the problem of privacy and big data, it's not new. We always knew that it was happening. And now we are actually trying to deal with it. But I think personally that it's a little too late. Uh, the conception bias. So in order to have an AI, you need to train it. And by the material you're going to use to train the AI will impact the way the AI will respond. And the best example that we have is in 2017, Twitter's tried to launch this uh, chatbot AI that was called Tay. And because it was trained on Twitter language and use of language, didn't turn up well. There were a lot of racist remarks that they had to put it down, I think 16 hours right after the launch. So it's not good for business. And finally, the mission bias. So your AI, you're going to be to give it a mission. So as much as if you program your AI to kill people, no surprise, they're going to kill people. So you need to bear that in mind, and that's something that we know. The known unknowns, the extent of AI use, because we already know that it is in health, it is in finances, it is in IT, it is in IoT, it, is a, it looks a little bit of everywhere, but how much more? 
And that's where you have uh, discourses like Elon Musk talking about biotechnology and uh, implants in the brain, among other things. The security concerns, I mean, cybersecurity, we come back to this. So how much secure all those systems? The economy, how is it going to impact everyday life? And the health, like um, attachment, robots, could be something that is interesting to consider. The unknown unknowns, the other biases in decision making. We know that probably there are other biases in the way data is used and classified in those AIs, but we are discovering more and more biases within those machines. And the status quo is challenged, no matter the field. So that's a discussion that comes back a lot. It's how AI is a disruptive technology, but I mean, every technology that is in development is being disrupted at some point in its development. And the unknown unknowns, whether we will go to the actual artificial intelligence and not the tools that we have nowadays, or if we are going to have more cascading effects. So the more we are implementing in new devices, is it going to impact the other ones? Is it going to be neuronal? We don't have any idea for now. Oh, yeah, that's the nails. <laughs> so what do we do with those information? We know that we have a toolbox that is expanding in terms of technology with AI materials, but what do we do about it? <laughs> and uh, I, I tried to come with policy recommendations as much as I could because, I mean, I'm nobody, so I try. The first one is basically to enhance public awareness. And I'm kind of critical on that one, but that's always the thing that you need to talk about, how you talk to the public, how you provide accurate information to not create chaos, how to reduce the myth, all those things. And the likelihood of success is relatively low. Uh, let's be honest, it depends on the generation, it depends on the geographical representation. So it didn't work for a lot of Technologies, nuclear, for example, some people still have problems with the idea of nuclear energy being carbon free. So, uh, the second is public private partnership for AI education. And what I mean by AI education is everybody, even stakeholders, because as far as I am aware, I don't think most presidents or prime ministers actually know what AI is or how to actually have a definition of it. So, how can you push for better? Um, regulations locally already if they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so encourage public-private partnerships and it's dependent in terms of success on whether the private sector is afraid of espionage because we had this case uh, during a during uh, cyber attacks and the incentive to get information. The third one is establish agile regulatory frameworks, keep pace with the creation of new technologies and trying to balance innovation with the ethical considerations. And that's an important thing because you cannot stop innovation. If you try to stop it anyway, it's coming back to your place. So it's better for you to know where it's coming from and try to orient the rules as much as you can in your priorities. Uh, the likelihood of success for me, it's double. Either you are not going to have any results because we are still waiting for results in internet informational technology. So why AI would change something? Or quite the contrary, because AI is relatively new and people are so much afraid about it, maybe it would drive them to the table. We don't know yet. We'll find out very soon. Uh, they're trying to get uh, an AI a document at the moment. So we find out. And then more technically, they are talking about establishing collaborative, collaborative regulatory sandboxes. Um, I mean, it's a way to experiment the AI application in a controlled environment to sandbox, but because of the way AI works, I don't think that, in theory, it is a complete way of testing. But in the end, when it's in an environment with so much data, it's going to be overloaded. So this measure, while good or keeping your mind uh, happy about it, it's probably not very effective. And finally, uh, mandatory algorithmic impact assessments. So introduce this assessment of algorithms. It's like the sandbox, but in another way with more methodology. And same, theoretically it's complete, but there is no such a thing of uh, an insurance in high tech. So you can try it, but in the end you will still have surprise because the possibilities are infinite. 
So now the conclusions. Right, we have seen a lot of things. I try to be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, AI today risks to be considered another problem form to the IT uh, cyber challenges. So now the question is, should we talk more about augmented intelligence? I believe so, because artificial is not grasping the full idea. Uh, tools enhancing the creator's intelligence, or is it too deep rooted in the language and too late? Which is most likely. Uh, also, technology is as dangerous as we intend it to be. So, if you want problems to be gone, change humans. That's uh, my narrative, as much as you can. And finally, I think one of the most uh, important challenges in this field is the siloing of the field. People tend to treat it more and more as something entirely different to all the problems that we have seen before, and I don't abide by that. If it looks like a dog, it smells like a dog. No, it's probably a dog. And the fact is computer and information science is also in this box. And then you have this idea of the industrial military complex. So you go back to the loop. And the over specialization, the feeling of control to be uh, to a close group. And it's not happening either. So as uh, Luc Julia was saying, it's a French um, AI new scientist, I would say, he said, I understood that we needed to stop just being specialists in one discipline, and that it was important to listen to what others had to tell us, biologists, psychologists, sociologists, cats, and others. And I think we should go towards that road and maybe uh, modernize the field a little more. In that note, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, recommendation book. So you can stop stupid. And it means that if you create a design that allows people to make mistakes, to have bad intentions, no wonder that something malicious is going to happen. So users will inevitably make mistakes that we all know of, and the failure is not planning for those failures and malicious intents. And that's it for me, so thank you. Thank you so much. So for the next presentation, we'll be moving on to the of this stuff. Yes. So I was thinking of a good metaphor to start with while we, while we get the slides ready. I don't have one, but I think my presentation is a bit like Christmas dinner. Because you start it when you're already kind of tired after a long day. And then I put way too much on the table and we all know it. But we'll continue to the end anyway. So, um, yeah, in the meantime, my name is Joel Christoph. I'm a PhD researcher at the European University Institute. Um, I got interested in nuclear risk reduction around two, three years ago. At the time, I went to the Republic of Korea to a program called uh, NERIC at the Korea Advanced Institute for Science and Technology. I worked in a team of uh, nuclear engineers, a stable economist, and they told me a lot of things, most of which I forgot, but a few of them I remember, which I'll try to present. Um, okay, great. Let me make sure that I don't take two hours. So, would you like to turn the lights on? Or are you okay? I think it's better with them off. You speak a little louder. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So, ah, uh, yeah, this works. Great. So, um, in short, I tried to reduce it quite a bit, <laughs> but it still has eight things. So, first, a little bit about uh, kind of context, um, what, where I think we are in terms of nuclear weapons, uh, AI systems and benefits, and also connectivity, so the kind of context in which they intersect. The second are a little bit more directly into the applications of AI to reduce nuclear risks, only some of them, because we don't have time to go through the 100-page IAEA report. And then we're going to talk a little bit more of uh, maybe detection of nuclear programs, the extent to which it might or might not be possible, treaty compliance, reducing accidental use, materials monitoring, um, and diplomacy, and then uh, very short policy recommendations. Um, great. So, yeah, very briefly, um, I'm not really going to say much new. You're all very familiar with, with things, but it's uh, concerning uh, in, to hopefully many people that we're continuing to see an uh, expansion in both the, the um, modernization and the amount of nuclear weapons in, in most uh, nuclear weapons uh, owning states. And in this context, I think that 
Um, this is probably the most important slide. I don't know if you've already seen this figure, um, but it's um, pretty much going to make it, I think, a lot easier to follow the rest. So I think one of it is that the reason I'm showing this uh, slide to you is just to, to be able to um, break down the different um, areas where a development and deployment of an AI system or an ML system, whatever we want to call it, can have uh, a lot of the um, errors in terms of um, delivering uh, the usefulness in terms of the final insight. So there's going to be perhaps um, structured and or unstructured data that is conditioned in some way through computing devices. We apply a, a model to it to obtain what we uh, understand more commonly as knowledge. And then there's going to be uh, some teaming. So maybe I'll use the mouse so you can follow a little bit of what I Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, great. So uh, then there's um, going to be some decision making involved on the spectrum of fully human to fully uh, non human. And then there's the users. And I think at all of these points, there's a point of failure, um, which is going to be very important in terms of the overly optimistic um, suggestions I'll be making in this presentation. So um, one thing that arises from it is that there's a couple different benefits. Again, nothing new, but um, some of them would be relating to the computer vision and natural language processing, classification tasks, prediction, anomaly detection, um, and perhaps creative data generation, less so, as all ways that we can try to reduce risks, whether from error or terror, relating to nuclear weapons and also nuclear reactors. So um, there's far too much going on in uh, this field, but also in this slide. Um, so you have a big image here to kind of capture a couple of the things. Um, I think the one that tends to get the most attention is the command and control. And this is also, I think, the most common narrative relating to AI plus nukes, um, where you have very um, large number of devices operating in the world, satellites and uh, early warning systems, decision making that's involved and then forces that need to respond to a particular threat. And the AI is going to make this system great. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, the kind of common story, I think, is that, uh, so this is um, excellent work from, from Peter Haltenbach on how um, the inclusion of, of machine learning in uh, nuclear command control and communications can actually worsen the whole situation because there's a pressure to do so uh, because of competition among powers. There's uh, then modernization possibilities. And because of flaws in the system or in the human machine relationship, there can be incorrect assessments coming out of an AI that's making an assessment of a situation. And so during, in particular, a, a nuclear crisis, you can get an increased uh, chance of inadvertent nuclear use. Mm -hmm. So this is what we get. It's um, the end is nigh because of AI. Um, and we need to find some way to stop it. So what, uh, well, okay. So how can risks actually decrease due to AI? So that was a pretty long intro, but I think it's um, <laughs> one uh, way of getting into it and to just pick a few ones. I think there's definitely a role to play in terms of detecting <clears throat> some uh, nuclear programs from combination of sources. It can be open source, satellite, and so on. Assessing treaty compliance is actually just the other side of the coin in some sense. Reducing accidental or unauthorized use, you can think of the role in safeguards, for instance. And then enhancing early warning systems is more directly the military application. Um, so first, in terms of detecting nuclear programs, this is something which is already being uh, developed. So it's an example from the uh, Pacific Northwest National uh, Laboratory uh, in the United States that works uh, with different university research groups and so the IAEA to um, use a combination of data inputs, including uh, satellite imagery, as you might imagine, but also um, large swaths of um, open source uh, intelligence, uh, social media as well, to some extent, to identify the potential risks of um, existing programs changing course or um, anomalies relating to uh, data, the early detection of suspicious activities, uh, and so on. And so this is a, a way of increasing both the efficiency, but also in some sense, in the same way that medical imagery might be benefiting, um, the abilities to detect uh, activity um, relating to error or terror. Um, this has, uh, as you might imagine, some chances of, of not working great. So it's a classical example of an image of a panda, and then there's a computer vision that uh, without noise is somewhat confident it's a panda, and then you add the noise and then to the human, it's still a panda, but then it thinks it's a given. 
And um, that is perhaps the case, but I think in um, nuclear, uh, yeah, in, in this context, it's a little bit less of, a, of an issue, particularly given the uh, aggregated level of data that would be used. Another, which is very closely related, is the uh, assessing treaty compliance. So this follows almost uh, directly that the ability to analyze large volumes of data and identify anomalies of different kinds. So these can be arising um, yeah, from satellite imagery, as might have been the case in uh, North Korea or to some extent Iran, or um, for instance, the uh, particles that would be uh, present in, in certain samples. Uh, these are all areas where I think there's also a ability to reduce uh, nuclear risks. Um, and then um, another one would be in terms of reducing the accidental or unauthorized use directly. So I think there's a, a lot of the aspects relating to command and control that have been discussed already, uh, but additional ones would be in terms of um, the more uh, second order, so not just the actual decisions to launch, for instance, but you can think, for instance, of uh, potential security breaches in nuclear facilities or access to, to information in the same way that most or virtually all uh, nuclear weapon states uh, were able to develop their nuclear weapons with the aid of at least one other country. Um, and the same would go, for instance, for movements, again, not the, the launch, but the unauthorized uh, movement or tampering of uh, nuclear assets. These are all areas where there's also quite a few possibilities to um, make a reduction in the risks as opposed to an increase. Um, I think uh, the one on monitoring nuclear materials is also very similar. So there's also a bunch of uh, different applications. So here, especially in a laboratory setting, you can imagine that when it comes to estimations and correlations among radiation levels, temperature, location, and so on, there's a bunch of different possibilities. And then the one that I think is the most interesting, but also the hardest to understand because of how I structured the slide, is that you have um, a, quite a few increasing uses of um, kind of uh, computer-assisted diplomacy. So here it's actually literal, as in the game diplomacy that's played uh, humans versus um, AI versus humans plus AI, where the humans plus AI tend to perform significantly better after getting used to how um, it works. Um, the top right is kind of an example of how an AI-assisted crisis management model might work. And again, it's too small, so I'm sorry you can't see it. Um, and then the bottom right is, I think, more in terms of, let's say, the communications and the understanding, the person-to-person -person understanding of uh, diplomacy, where it's possible given the huge amounts of data that there are on social media in particular. So these are looking at uh, Twitter accounts to see what's the sentiment analysis of different politicians um, uh, a Twitter accounts sentiments towards particular issues. So um, these are some ways that people might prepare a little bit differently and, and help particularly the diplomatic cores that are more resource constrained to tailor, uh, for instance, their approaches and the form and the content of their approaches to other diplomatic uh, bodies. Um, very briefly, I think uh, I'm not quite at 10 minutes, but almost. Mm -hmm. um, I cut it down in terms of policy recommendations. Actually, a lot of it is things you're already quite familiar with, fostering more collaboration, information sharing, particularly developing tools and frameworks, establishing the regulations and guidelines, um, civil society also advocating for uh, accountability and transparency. And um, some of these are already done quite a lot. For instance, the IAEA has a data stewardship team that is uh, developing its own nuclear applications using uh, machine learning methods. There's quite a lot of things happening in this field that I don't uh, know about. And then there's much more actually in the CPRI paper. Um, so I won't go into that. And then uh, I think this is my last slide. Okay, so that's great. Uh, but what does AI change? And the reason I want to end on this is because I think we focus a lot on the areas where technology is changing this. It's so such a hot topic. There's um, so many risks that, and opportunities that arise out of it. But in economics, which is the field that I'm coming from, there is um, this guy called William Baumol who came up with uh, what, what's called the Baumol's cost disease, that the things which become very expensive over time are the things which you cannot improve. The necessary things on which you must spend, resources, money, time, et cetera, but which you cannot solve because of technological progress. And I think that that's one area where also in this field, whether it's human to human relations, um, the yeah. institutional decision-making that arises in, in different types of contexts, these are the areas where we should be focusing a lot more. Uh, thanks.
Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, our next presenter, um, Amy Ariane Man Lock, will be now presenting. So I'll hand over the presentation to you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's really glad to be back from London. Back to London. I've been like studying London for four years. So after my undergrad in SOAS in international relations and history, and my master in London School of Economics. So I'm currently working in New York. So I literally take my flight from New York to here yesterday morning and flying back tomorrow evening. So, so, <laughs> if I'm not doing great, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so today I'm looking into AI and global security and how it changed navigate the military and geopolitical landscape. Mm -hmm. I think like AI has been such a hot topic like in the last one and a half years, probably too hot to a sense that like probably people got annoyed. But today I will more focus on like on the geopolitical implications and the policy area. So overall for the introduction, I will talk about overall the AI in global security first. And then I'll focus on US, China, and military competition on an AI and the AI transformative impact on warfare and geopolitics. And also the geopolitical implications from, from current conflict and AI armor and policy recommendation for my presentation. So firstly, I will talk about AI armor. I mean, probably that's the most biggest like implication to global peace and security for AI. AI is such a like a powerful weapon, like to fully autonomize like drones, aircraft warship or whatever like tank. This will significantly improve like a country military capability. Especially currently China and United States is currently in a new core dynamic, whether you agree or not, both countries are fighting for the best in the world. And this race will have will increase the investment in AI a lot. I'll just give you an example about how the cost of AI compared to the traditional military using the, the, the gold shark, which is currently invested by the Australian government. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, like uh, um, a normal military, like nuclear, I mean, we talk about 20, 23 billion AUD. But if you use like a unmanned, unmanned like nuclear submarine without anyone to control it, it will only cost 1% of the cost of each submarine, and it will be delivered by mid 2025 in comparison to be the normal nuclear submarine will be delivered in 2050, which is 25 years later. So, in currently, you actually have about 800 AI related unclassified projects. So we kind of imagine probably have that 8,000 AI classified project USA is doing secretly to upgrade. And currently, there's about 1.8 billion for AI and machine learning in 2024, on top of 1.4 billion for billion dollar for specific initiative that is for AI like vehicle sensor, like facial recognition across the board. So in terms of AI military strategy, I will focus more about like the current very hot trend like in Silicon Valley, like there are a lot of like PC in like military AI equipment. One of the one of the very like um, very like common like they're using is called the instrument multiple integrated laser engagement system. So basically this system they would install in a, like a tank, like an M1 tank currently. So what happens in the future is like the tank doesn't require a human to drive it. It will sense a, a, like a target, a tank, a person and will hit, hit it. The, if the, the efficiency is not clear because like, it's still currently in investigation, but this will, will transform the whole like current like, tense battle in the future. As imagine like no, no casualty will be occur. Also, the Department of Defense in USA have tried to add AI enable autonomous vehicle by 2026. Although I very doubt they can do it in 2026 according to US efficiency. Also, there's another like military uh, implication as well. Currently, currently, the U.S. Space Force has also like invested like in a system can identify like forty thousand subjects on space that will like help them to better alarm in miss missile warning or in spies or in spies thing as well. Uh, so it's a power yeah, it's not just like that. yeah. So, so I can say.
Okay, so we have technical Yes, that's what I Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for the technical issue, like AI doesn't solve everything. Right? <laughs> so, human, you need to solve the problem. So, no worry for the job loss, like in the future. Okay, so talk about this slide. So, I'll go into more about ethical and legal concerns. Although I will talk less about this, since there's so many uh, present great presenters like have talked throughout the day. So, I think the first thing about accountability in AI driven military, as well, I think there's a very good example. Like, I don't know, have you guys watched the Eagle Eye? In the, the movie Eagle Eye, it's to be 12 years ago. That's why it's basically like essentially like an AI decides to take military action and human can't override, and AI is not happy, so they kill the president. Like, <laughs> anyway, but they didn't do it. So, this is a very, I think, good example to raise like when AI and human have like <laughs> conflicts like in military, like how do we solve the problem? And the second thing is uh, adopting international law for AI warfare. So, how do we apply like universal standards of AI for international law? And finally, facial recognition, how do we protect personal privacy as well? So I'll come to like the geopolitical implication and deterrent, expanded the terrorist threats. I guess like probably many people in international relations have thought, thought about this term, like will China destined to go to war with USA by Graham Allison in Harvard University. I think like in terms of expressing why it's very important related to AI and global peace and security. Firstly, all the global war is start from small war to regional war to global war. If you look at first world war, second world war, they doesn't start with like great power conflict. They start with very small conflict and one by one, one by one, one by one, probably like 200 small events become like a major global event. And I think that will be probably the current trend we can see like in the new 2024 already. So firstly, I will use like a very good example, like in the current situation in West Sea, where like the, the militant group in Yemen use able to use AI drone to attack like ships across the Red Sea. Although like then the none of the target have been hit, but USA and Allies require hundred times of the money to intercept those missiles. So this already told you like like war costing to start a war will be reduced. When the cost to start a war will be reduced, that means that more people in the city, different stakeholder power hungry institutes of human beings. They were really willing to start work to protect the interest or gain other people's interest. So, in this term, AI have helped them do a lot of things. And this will increase the, the chances for war, for war, like globally, because of AI. Additionally, like in terms of nuclear deterrence, although I won't go deep on that as well, like imagine like if giving AI for more full control of nuclear deterrence, that's also increased the, the chances of like a global nuclear war. There's, I remember there's like a, a research by like a Japan think tank. If there's a war between China and Taiwan and nuclear weapons have been involved, imagine if AI also be involved, they will be using about 12 nu nuclear warheads and probably 2 million people will be dead, like between Taiwan, Japan, and mainland China and South Korea as well. And that's the kind of very optimistic scenario. So I would now look into the policy recommendation. How do we solve this like current tension between China and USA, especially the, in the AI armories? My policy recommendation will be establish a high level committee with major power, with the moderator, with neutral state. The reason we can see, like, we let's be honest, United Nations is not the best 
like best organization to maintain global peace and security, especially when I'm based in New York, I can do that totally. Like when no, no one even knows UN is in New York. So <laughs> when the, the, initially when UN have the General Assembly, none of my colleagues know about it. Even all the New York is closing more closer. So my suggestion would be like example neutral country like Singapore, Switzerland, Dubai, Qatar would be the neutral country mm -hmm. to establish the AI Global Security Committee to regulate like AI safety. With the involvement of US, China, EU, and UK. The reason I choose these four bodies is because these four bodies probably account like 90% of the AI technology and global military power as well. This committee will ensure the transparent communication, share ethical standards, and collaboration of AI technology control to mitigate global security needs as well. The reason I also use why the neutral state is such an important body, like in this policy recommendation, is there's some historical precedent to be successful. And something like the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty in 1988 is moderated by Switzerland in Geneva, where both presidents of both the Union and USA have come to an agreement, although Putin has pulled out it last year, so it doesn't work anymore. Anyway. And also there's other examples of neutral states able to maintain global peace and security. Example, the like Hamas and Israel conflict is navigated by Qatar, although it's not very successful, but at least there's some more progress than the United Nations. Addi additionally, we can also see like Switzerland currently will be organizing a global peace summit for Ukraine issue as well. So that's also see the importance of neutral state and working with the United Nations and global power as well. So in conclusion, in order to maintain like a safe global peace and security with AI, a, a very com comprehensive dialogue between global power, neutral state and international organizations like United Nations is very important. This will able to avoid a lot of hotspot, a lot of like miscommunication in military like competition. Additionally, private institutions like Open AI and Profit also need to be involved because a lot of the AI technology is provided by them. Especially, example like Amazon provided the drive service, the, the drive service for like the Department of Defense in the United States mm -hmm. as well. This rapid like technological advancement will increase the speed of conflicts, and that's will definitely inevitable, especially when much more small and small conflict will be exactly exactly. But hopefully in the future, we'll cross our fingers in this last mode. Thank you. That was a great one. Thank you so much for the presentation. So we will be moving on to our last speaker, who is Mama Jabali, who is an AI governance researcher, and they are currently online. So I will be passing on the presentation to you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present some of my ideas and work under the research project Remit with you. Uh, also, that's a missed opportunity for me to not be present uh, in the meeting. However, I'm looking forward to a very brief uh, presentations, plus uh, hopefully some comments and questions. And in the meantime, I hope that you hear me loud and clear. Uh, my topic is about European democratic uh, multilateralism in shaping global military AI governance. Uh, there is somehow a general consensus that uh, there is no globally acknowledged or globally accepted governance frameworks for governing military AI from its development until its utilizations. And by the word of governance, so it's a very comprehensive term which encompasses regulations, restrictions, bans, or any other visions or any other formats for governing or overseeing uh, a military AI. So we do not have such a thing. However, last year, uh, two initiatives launched uh, on the one day, in one occasion, in one uh, in city, uh, one the global summit on responsible artificial intelligence in the military domain, uh, which is known as RIEN, and the second one within the RIEN, the United States introduced political declaration on responsibility on responsible military use of artificial intelligence and autonomy. So. Each of them have their own distinct features and characteristics, but both of them are entirely fo focusing on military AI, not really on civilian AI or dual use technologies. So uh, 
probably we can say that right now we have only these two initiatives that both of them are gaining traction, both of them are seeking more endorsement, and both of them right now focusing on normative framework, but their vision at the end is to come up with a convention or treaty either within the United Nations or outside. So I just briefly go through each of them and then I introduce my policy recommendation, which revolves and focuses on, on the re-aim uh, idea. Well, for the political declaration, uh, right as of January 2024, 51 states and countries have endorsed and the United States will convene uh, the endorser uh, very soon to discuss how to develop the idea and how to move forward. So it has some uh, features that I think that these five features are very important at the same time uh, reveals the contrast with the other one, with the other one, the re -aim. So it's uh, the, the, the US believes that military AI governance should be done outside the UN uh, because the UN does not have that capacity. Also, the US wants to demonstrate and exhibit its American leadership on this very salient topic, because right now, uh, at least to my understanding, American compares AI or military AI with nuclear weapons and nuclear powers. So they think that American leadership is required to govern military AI as it did uh, during the time for the nuclear powers and nuclear weapons. So we can understand everything vis-a-vis -vis military AI through the lens of Sino-American strategic rivalries and why Americans put forward this idea and China uh, uh, avoids or ignores this political declar declaration by not signing this uh, declaration. Uh, the, the very interesting feature that uh, political declaration possesses is it's quite at the state level. So no other stakeholders, no other ultranational or subnational actors are involved. It's just for states, uh, because I think, as I indicate in the last point, the United States knows what it wants from this political declaration. So it just looks to build and then reinforce or strengthen the coalition. So uh, the political declaration contains nine visions, nine ideas. And right now the United States just try to build the coalition around these visions. On the other hand, we have the re-aim uh, that's similar to the, to the US one uh, introduced or actually convened in, in February, 2023 by the Netherlands and Republic of Korea. Uh, it, it was organized and it was held in, in The Hague. And uh, so unlike the political declaration, uh, it is not an open ending process. So on the second day or the last day of the conference and summit, 57 countries out of 80 participating countries endorse the declaration and endorse the, the summit, endorse their final uh, resolution of the summit known as call to action. Uh, but I need just in parenthesis mention that for the U.S. Uh, endorsement is open. So um, any, any country can endorse and then the list on the U.S. Department of State's websites will be updated. But for this one, it's, it's closed. So right now, seven, uh, 57 countries uh, have endorsed the call to action. It has uh, two specific and distinct characteristics. One is decentralized, it's quite bottom up and also depoliticize its inclusive and multi-stakeholder. What does it mean? It means that uh, almost every country, including China, uh, by, by, by every country, I mean uh, key countries uh, have endorsed this, uh, this call to action. But at the same time, uh, during the summit, massive number of NGOs, civil societies, companies, corporations, private sectors and different stakeholders involved brainstorm in order to bring some understanding and also vision of what military AI should look like and how it should be governed. And at the same time, if you read the, the call to action, the final declaration of the summit, 
uh, it is almost look for uh, epistemic communities, look for think tanks, universities, academic people to gather together to develop, to introduce ideas in order to make the picture clearer of what military AI is and, and how it should be governed. So it's quite bottom up. It's not really state-based, it's not really top-down that the, the Netherlands or, the, or South Korea wants to push their region or their ideas, but mostly looks for different stakeholders uh, brainstorm about the military AI. But whether it is democratic or not, this is, uh, this is my, my policy recommendation actually, or, or the major one. And I think that it can be democratic if it's going uh, to be integrated into multilateralism. And that's why I introduced the concept of democratic multilateralism with several features. So within the European jargons or uh, encyclopedia, we have different versions of multilateralism, effective multilateralism, and recently strategic multilateralism, which means uh, less focus on values and more attention to interests and in engage with different uh, stakeholders, actor states, respective of whether they represent or mirror our, in our visions or our values or not. But democratic multilateralism, this is my idea. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your feedback, critics, idea, whether uh, it holds true to you or not, contain at least three aspects. So uh, first and foremost, it's about empathy. And it could be legal empathy. It could be institutional empathy. So any aspect of empathy, which means that if Europeans, or if REAIM wants to put forward its idea for military AI governance to REAIM, so it should listen to the legal constraints of other countries. It, there, there should be some sort of engagement and dialogue. And this is not just uh, for the sake of listening, but also integrating and incorporating those ideas or those visions from the rest of the world into your idea, into your vision. So this is point number one, uh, that I think that that could be the main pillar, or at least the first pillar of democratic multilateralism. The second one is a balance between ambition and humility. So uh, probably recently uh, we heard, for example, from Mr. Joseph Burrell, uh, EU high representative, that after the invasion of Ukraine, he said that, okay, let's listen to the rest of the war or what we are looking for does not really reflect uh, to the rest of the war. So we need to listen, we need to engage with the rest of the war, particularly after the result of the UN General Assembly vote or different forums that uh, Europeans at least understand that not all countries are against Russia or not all countries at least on board with European Union. So that ambition and that humility that we need to listen, we need to engage, uh, is very important also for democratic multilateralism. But at the same time, it is very important that uh, listening to them does not really mean that we, we should just listen. We also need to take lessons from them to integrate and incorporate their ideas into our understanding of the war or into the European understanding of the war. This, this is very important. Uh, and, and the last one is about differentiation, which means that if you are interested in governing military AI, probably you cannot handle everything in one setting or in one time frame. So maybe you need to divide uh, different components and aspects, and then based on capabilities, willingness, and abilities of different stakeholders, then you should move forward the idea. And it is much closer to uh, democracy rather than if you want to just bring your idea uh, on the table and that encompasses everything. So these are three aspects for democratic multilateralism. And I think that if the Europeans or particularly the European Union uh, or any, any European countries wants to demonstrate their actorness in the field of military AI governance, so the REAM can provide some basis because it is multi-stakeholder uh, engagement. It is also inclusive, but at the same time, it should be democratic. And uh, democratic multilateralism 
should should require I mean, uh, might might be required if Europeans want the success of the re aim or at the end uh, the uh, the inclusion of all the stakeholders either states or or different stakeholders corporations uh, NGOs etc for governing military AI uh, uh, at the end whether it, it wants to be done at the UN level or whether they are looking for different platforms and forums. And uh, yeah, that's that's all uh, I just wanted to say. I stop here. And uh, for, again, thank you very much for this opportunity, but I'm looking forward to your comments and also addressing any questions that might arise. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone presenting. We're just going to think briefly go through some questions, just because I am aware of time and that we have overrun. So 10 minutes of questions will be in this case. So I'm going to start with the people in the room first. Does anyone have any questions to ask? Um, so I will, I think so, I'll do Yan and also you as well. Um, if you want to go ahead first and ask the question. Sure. Um, I have a question to you. Uh, so about the sentence, uh, technology is as dangerous as we tend to use it. Um, one counter argument that's often used uh, that I would love to hear an answer to um, is that because of limited advances in interpretability research and complexity of the technology, it's hard to predict um, what output and analysis produces, similar to you know, function research, and that makes accidents hard to avoid. Uh, there are even accidents in technology that theoretically should be able to predict, uh, like you know, Chernobyl. Um, if we think that the past 30 years of advances in AI capabilities or machine learning are an indicator of the next 30 years, then we could potentially be worried about the large unintended effects of these technologies. Okay. What's your name? Just Lara. Lara. And Jan, you have a question? Um, yeah, um, I have two more or less. Um, the first one is to, to Ariane because you mentioned the AI arms race um, between the US and China. Um, because this is also such a dual use um, capability, how would you, like, how do you envision like, the escalation? Like, are we yeah. first on the right? Fluent motion between where we are now, the semi autonomous uh, systems, and then at some point, maybe some super general um, spectrum on all troops. Um, and which, which steps would you maybe see there in the process? Um, and then maybe to the others, because there was a lot of talk now about um, governance and also on the panel I have with Viola um, about the integration with the nuclear and the risk reduction now. A um, bit of an open question, but where do you think it makes sense to have like separate AI regime and uh, where do you kind of draw the line to okay, this is something that will also more, um, for example, in the UK? Yeah. Okay, sure. So to answer your question, like from like, I will for more from a history perspective, like, seems like when there's a great two great power compete, there are no borderline, essentially, like what we, what we can see. Example, like when USA and Nazi compete for nuclear weapon, although not then after Oklahoma, probably everyone knows about the story. Like it seems like it's going to the extreme. I think like for AI arm race, China and United States will go to as far as they can. Like for economic, because like AI is just it's not just about military and political, it's also about economic development as well. So if you're like able to maximize the power of AI, you can maximize the GDP to like 10%, 20% growth per year, apparently to some research, but I need to deep dive for that. In terms of military, imagine if you're able to use AI to for fully autonomous army or not fully autonomous, semi-autonomous army. In sense, you have like two times to three times of your military capability compared to nowadays. And I don't think like President of China or President of the United States will give up this opportunity. And either the Chinese people or the United States people will give up to losing the number one title in the global league. So I think we'll go, go pretty bad. But how bad? I don't know. It depends on the regional conflict. China, Taiwan, the, the, the escalation between China and Taiwan, the South Sea, the Ukraine war, or the Middle East. I think this free hotspot would be very good indication in 2024, I see. And also the 2024 election of USA. I think that would be also a very interesting key point to see how that's moving forward. Thank you. Yes, it's my turn. Uh, so first, thank you for your question, Lauren. And um, 
Um, I mean, yeah, this race technology is as dangerous as we intended to be. I think it's a, it's like a postulate, I would say, in any engineer uh, when they're inventing something. But regarding your comments, um, well, yes, there is limited knowledge to the speed, but we, as far as we are aware of, the research on AI has started as far as the 1950s, and you had two moments in which you had AI hibernation moment because people were getting so afraid that they retracted. And the question is, how much are we getting afraid and then retract again if it's going to happen, or are we continuing? And I think we most likely will continue, uh, but I am skeptical on how dangerous it's going to be, uh, to be honest, because for me, uh, the technology as it is today is very, I mean, predictable. You don't have any sense of multidisciplinary intent in the AI, so to speak. If you ask an AI to get the trash, they will get the trash. If there is a human falling in front of them, most likely they will just go around and collect the trash still. That's how the system was built. Then you just, uh, with time, probably you'll have more and more like an algorithms of decision making. So maybe soon we'll include some fake empathy. So if there is a human falling in front of you, you help him get up and then you collect the trash. Maybe that could be something that happens. But for now, it's very uh, binary. It's still binary, as I said. There is no creativity out of it somehow. And if that answers your question, and I mean, I'm happy to discuss it further yeah, because I think there is a <laughs> lot to say about that. Uh, about the AR and race, uh, I'm not a Chinese expert, but I think I join you for most of the things you have said. Uh, and about governance, um, I, I come from the cyber world, most. I mean, nuclear world cyber, you know, it's technology, it's wonderful. But um, that's why when people are talking about AI, like it's a different thing, it makes me, I'm like, come on, you use the same computer to do it. You know, that's what, you know what I mean? So I, I'm wondering how much you could use mistake to separate it, but at the same time, it could be a window of opportunity for the cyber aspect to actually point the AI incident. So maybe it's a window of opportunity we can take to develop other regimes uh, that we still have not find definitions and agreement about. Um, I might ask a question actually for all three panelists. And I think it might be an interesting question because it's kind of to do with how you all differently perceive a solution. So something that I've noticed throughout the conference, which is quite interesting, is that everyone has a kind of different idea of what a solution could look like or a different approach to it. So for some people, it's perhaps like a higher degree of communication, such as through committee, for instance, um, or you know, auditing, for instance, or um, in your case, kind of applying more sort of data analytical tools um, for compliance to verification methods and that kind of thing. And I'm just really interested in this case, how you all kind of view what a solution is, if that makes sense. Do you predominantly look at it from a different lens, for instance? Is that sort of unique contribution that you feel like your field provides? So for instance, in economy, do you feel like your kind of economist background provides you with a perspective that may not often be seen in another field or the same for you both as well? So are we biased? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> not necessarily biased, but I, I get the sense that everyone kind of views that to be a potential solution, but it's sort of viewed quite differently, for instance. Um, so, I mean, I think for all three of you, when it comes to regulation of AI, for instance, or regulation of nuclear weapons, I mean, how do you perceive the main, what is the main solution to what seems to be the most um, important or impactful solution to all three of you? Yeah, so, I think um, this is hard for me to answer because it's a bit like when um, you asked Victor, ask Victor Frankl back in the day, what's the best chess move? And he says it depends on the situation. And I think in a similar way, I can give you like a solution if you're talking about the problem. And I think my presentation was focused a lot more on what are some areas where um, some applications or continuing development of AI could be used to reduce certain types of risks, but I don't think it's a broader solution. And if, if the question is instead, what's the you know, the, the grand solution to world peace and like irreversible disarmament and so on. I think it has nothing to do with technology, well, maybe it does, but it's a lot more on the basis of 
how do you understand, how do you help people from all kinds of different cultures, countries, regions, languages, ages, etc., to understand that, uh, well, to, to get them to understand that uh, recognizing the suffering of others is the basis for peace. And until we get there for all kinds of different communities worldwide, we can talk of a lot of things, but there's no kind of longer term irreversibility. So in that sense, I would kind of deviate completely from my presentation and say, yeah, we can talk about those technical things, but actually if we look into some broader problem, the solutions might lie in a far harder place where I have no idea what we're going to do. And the IAEA doesn't have 100 page PDFs telling you what to do. <laughs> So like I would be honest, I would be biased because like, I'm more like from like an international affair field, like so I doesn't talk a lot about technical field and especially AI is a very technical thing. So like if you like a lot of technical expert to see the solution, but like for me, I think the always the best solution is like it's always see from history. Like although like sometimes people say history is not the best thing to look into, but I think if history is so this thing work, if you learn from it, adapt the context, it tends to work like work out sometimes. So Example, like my solution about neutral state is clearly in a lot of like major conflict, like neutral state literally play a very vital role to solve like, like global conflict and solution. And when I also look in like in general solution in general, I would always like use more like an entrepreneur mindset, like rather than like a policy mindset. It's like you need to be creative, but you need to be touched onto the ground. So that's what I my thoughts. Um, I mean, as for me, it's going to be mostly of course, we are going to have a different solution depending on where we come from, the, the culture, the field, whatever. But the most important thing is going to be to be, remain open-minded to what the other is bringing to the table because your solution is not going to be perfect, obviously. And um, discussing with people from different fields is what is going to make uh, the wealth of the solution. And it is striking for me to see that uh, most of the time, uh, policy uh, people only talk to policy people. Lawyers only talk to lawyers. Technical people only talk to technical people. And then you have also that in terms of regional approaches. And what turns out is that you have people that speak probably the same language, but don't understand each other. And uh, it's we need really, I think, to de-silo the different aspects, like vulgarize different aspects that can be science, it can be policy, whatever. And for, for instance, uh, Mahmoud, uh, I, I like your presentation. Um, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I would be happy to talk about it. So contact me, okay? <laughs> you want to hear from Mahmoud? Yes, of course. I'm sorry. Uh, just very briefly, I think that, I mean, I echo what Ocean said. But I really like the term reverse the gaze. And by reversing the gaze, mean just look what others are saying and not just what you say and try to implement or, or embed into any framework. So I think that uh, prerequisite to any efforts, it's just to reversing your gaze, to reversing your understanding, also grasping and also taking some insight from different stakeholders, different actors for any purpose, and then act based on all inputs and insight that have been collected. So maybe this is just my two cents on your question. Thank you so much. So I am going to ask maybe one question from the chat or more than okay. one. <laughs> if they can bring them up that one. It's up to you guys. We have people for one more question. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking I should give people <laughs> yeah, one more okay. time. So, Tim, if you could select an idea. Oh, me? No. Okay, great. That <laughs> hasn't been asked perhaps. Okay, well, that's a good one. Okay, well, um, <laughs> if it's so found, there was, um, it was here, but I can't see it. It seems to disappear. Okay. But, um, Yeah, was, there was a question from one of the people on it. I think because he logged off, his questions disappeared or something. Right. I think Julia, if Julia, you're, are you there? Julia, can you hear me? Because you've been asking lots of questions today. So if you want to, you're kind of like a, a star in online. So if you want to reveal yourself, yes. you can ask your question. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Julia. You've been asking lots of questions today, so I thought it'd be time for us to see you and let's, uh, you can ask yeah. your question directly. Yeah. 
There'll be the final question of the day, so go for it. <laughs> okay, so the first one, or which one should I just, one you, should I just go through all of them, or? Just whatever, whatever, whichever one's most important yeah, to you. Most important one. Okay. Just one, just one. Okay, so, um, okay, well, I was really wondering what you meant by using the term legal empathy in the context of democratic multilateralism. Because you mentioned empathy, but uh, and also legal empathy, and I'm very much interested into international law and how international law, especially in the law of armed conflict, um, kind of interacts with artificial intelligence. Um, because that's also like my master. It's also focus. Uh, it focuses on this, and I want to maybe focus my master thesis on this. But I'm a bit unsure whether you can find a lot of stuff, um, especially when it comes to the like. Um, in law of armed conflict um, uh, aspect. Um, and I stumbled upon this legal empathy term, which I find very interesting, yeah. Well, thank you so much for raising this uh, important questions and also concern because I also received similar feedback from different people when I mentioned the, the term of legal empathy. So uh, it's, it's mostly relates to the governance aspect rather than the technical or AI. But at the same time, I understand that maybe within law or even within governance, this is not really applicable. But uh, I mean, in short, if, I, if empathy can be defined as the ability to put ourselves uh, or to put oneself in, in the shoes of another, I think legal empathy consists of a deep cooperative engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, with with each other systems, each other legal systems, but sometimes with, with each other's institutional, if you want to do something interregional, if the EU wants to engage with the ASEAN or African Union or League of Arab States, so it's also an institutional engagement, mm -hmm. uh, just to assess. I mean, this is really for assessment, evaluation, gaining some insight about what others think, and also what are the differences? Because you have your own vision within RIEN, but at the same time, you are not really familiar and quite aware of others' vision and what others think. Uh, and if I may, I know that uh, there is no time, but I forgot to actually show this one. So this is just coming from the Davos World Economic Forum. And I think that UN Tech Envoy raises a very good point that so this AI, uh, actually he mentioned about the civilian AI, but I think that that is also applicable to military AI that whether we call it Global South, Global East, so there are different names, but I think this is a litmus test governance for AI to bring everyone on board, particularly those states that have been marginalized or side uh, sidelined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's somehow probably encapsulates legal empathy. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.